Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron Zellin, the Richard Borough Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy's um, Reinhardt Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence. We have an excellent and timely guest today uh, as part of our continuing counterterrorism lecture series, uh, Deputy Assistant Director of the FBI's Counterterrorism Division, Matthew Elkoch, uh, who leads its intelligence branch. In his role, he is responsible for deployment of the Bureau's overall strategies against the most significant terrorist threats and the production of timely, comprehensive, and sophisticated intelligence products. Prior to his appointment this April, he served as Section Chief at the FBI's Office of Partner Engagement, Supervisor of a Chicago Safe Streets and Gang Task Force, Assistant Section Chief in the Counterterrorism Division's Operational Analysis Branch of the Foreign Terrorist Tracking Task Force, and the International Terrorism Operations Section 2, and the Assistant Special Agent in Charge of the Criminal Branch in Atlanta. Um, before I turn it over to the Deputy Assistant uh, Director, however, I'd like to remind everybody to please either silence or turn off their phones just so we don't have any um, ringing tones going off. Um, and also, um, the statement for the record will be live streamed. However, once we turn it over to the question and answer, that will be off the record. So when we do that, please do not tweet, take pictures, videos, or anything related to that um, as well. And for now, I'll turn it over to the uh, Deputy Assistant Director. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Zellin, uh, Dr. Levitt, who is under the weather and couldn't be here today, uh, the Washington Institute, and all of you for having me here uh, to speak. Um, and to all those online watching, thank you also for joining in. Hopefully, at least one person is joining in from someplace a little sunnier and warm than we have it in DC right now. Um, I'm honored to represent the FBI uh, here uh, at this esteemed event. Uh, I'll offer you an up-to-date optic into the ever-evolving terrorism landscape with an eye to the homeland, which is our prior primary focus at the FBI. My intent is to provide an overview of the evolving and persistent terrorism threat as we see it in the FBI. I'll relay some of the investigative challenges as well as opportunities facing us with a shifted paradigm. To level set before I begin, I'll explain how the FBI approaches counterterrorism from an investigative standpoint. The FBI categorizes uh, counterterrorism investigations into two uh, categories, categories rather, international terrorism and domestic terrorism. And what uh, confuses some, probably uh, not those of, uh, those of us in the room here today though, is that those uh, designations don't re relate to where the subject of our investigation is located, um, which would seem logical. But uh, in fact, International terrorism includes investigations into members of designated foreign terrorist organizations, state sponsors of terrorism, and those inspired to violence by foreign terrorist organizations such as homegrown violent extremists who are actually located here in the U.S. The latter, who we refer to as HVEs, uh, are s individuals located inside the U.S., as I said, who take their own initiative to become radicalized primarily in the U.S and are inspired by, but not receiving individual direction from foreign terrorist organizations. Domestic terrorists are individuals who commit violent criminal acts in furtherance of ideological goals stemming from domestic issues, such as racial bias or anti-government sentiment. Most of our domestic terrorism cases fall into four categories, racially motivated violent extremism, anti-authority or anti-government extremism, uh, environmental and animal rights extremism, and abortion extremism, which is uh, violence related to both sides of the abortion issue. My comments today will focus largely on the international terrorism threat to the U.S., but to be clear, preventing acts of terrorism is the FBI's number one priority regardless of who or where uh, the uh, terrorism is being planned or committed. I'll set the stage by discussing the FBI's evolution uh, in the 18 years since the September 11, 2001 attacks and why we're stronger, more agile, and better able to confront the threat of terrorism, both international and domestic. After the 9-11 attacks, we asked ourselves, what could we have done better? And every day since, we've asked ourselves, what do we need to do to keep the American people safe from terrorism today, tomorrow, and the day after that? 
First off, we've torn down whatever walls were separating agencies and were preventing collaboration. We've significantly improved the way we share information, not only uh, among law enforcement and the intelligence community, but also among our private sector and foreign partners. Sharing is now the rule rather than the exception. Because of this increased collaboration, we've developed a whole of government approach to combating terrorism over the past 18 years. During the course of our investigations, we are able to bring the full force of the U.S. intelligence community, the law enforcement community, and the judicial system to bear against these bad actors. Underpinning all of our successes is our commitment to partnerships. In fact, one of the most critical elements of the FBI's counterterrorism strategy is the FBI-led Joint Terrorism Task Forces, partnerships between law enforcement at the federal, state, and local levels committed to preventing acts of terrorism. The FBI has JTTFs, as we call them, in all 56 of our field offices around the country, many of which have more than one JTTF, depending upon the geography they're covering. Those JTTFs have over 4,000 investigators in total, bringing a holistic capability to the fight. It's an integrated investigative approach to terrorist detection and prevention. What hasn't changed is the FBI's commitment to preventing all acts of terrorism in the United States and against U.S. interests overseas. The whole of government approach we now bring to the counterterrorism mission positions us to best address the dynamic threat we face today. So what does this threat look like 18 years after 9-11? I'll begin with what we consider long-standing terrorism threats that have persevered emanating from overseas groups. We're still, certainly still laser focused on foreign terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. As you know, these organizations wish to cause us harm every day and pose the biggest Sunni terrorist threat to U.S. interests overseas. Simply put, the lethal threat from these groups persists despite significant setbacks and defeats. Al-Qaeda in particular has proven resilient despite the death of Osama, of Osama bin Laden in 2011. AQ's desire to carry out large-scale spectacular attacks in the United States is clear. And we're also paying close attention to Al-Qaeda's affiliates like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda in Syria. As we continue to monitor the situation in Syria, we know that the threat from ISIS remains despite its loss of territory, resources, and leadership. Even after suffering significant defeats, including the loss of its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, ISIS is able to rely on global support, including its branches around the world. Of particular concern within our own borders, ISIS's model of online recruitment and propaganda encourages supporters to take actions against soft targets wherever they're located. We've seen this call to action through online channels play out across the U.S. and the West. In March, a man arrested right next door in Maryland admitted to planning a vehicle ramming attack in the name of ISIS. And in August, authorities disrupted a plot to conduct a stabbing in Queens, New York, on behalf of the same terrorist organization. Neither of these individuals received specific direction from ISIS in their attack plan, but they sought out and found propaganda created by ISIS or its support network online, which inspired them to plot an attack. In addition to countering the threat from Sunni terrorist groups, we ha also have worked to mitigate the threat from Iranian-supported groups who are plotting and conducting attacks. We know that the government of Iran aims to preserve its regime and export its Islamic revolution worldwide through the use of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force, through its strategic partner Hezbollah, and through its proxy group's position to harm U.S. interests in the Middle East. The threat from state actors has also reached our shores. In just the past two months, two men pleaded guilty to conducting surveillance against Jewish and Israeli facilities here in the U.S. and against Iranian dissidents at the direction of the government of Iran. Across the globe, these foreign terrorist groups and state actors have suffered significant defeats through military and intelligence efforts by the U.S. and others, but we can't take the eye, our eye off the ball. Their violent determination persists. 
I'll move now from discussing these overseas organizations and nation states because I'd also like to discuss how the threat has evolved within our own borders. A decade ago, these organizations I've just discussed posed the largest terrorist threat to the U.S. Today, as evidenced by recent attacks, the greatest threat we face in the homeland emanates, emanates from radicalized lone actors of any ideology who look to attack soft targets with easily accessible weapons, often firearms. These lone actors span our international and domestic terrorism cases and includes both homegrown violent extremists inspired by foreign terrorist organizations as well as domestic violent extremists inspired to commit violence in furtherance of domestic ideologies such as racial bias or anti-government sentiment. Homeland plotting has shifted from in-person networks motivated by local radicalizers to self-starting violent extremists inspired by online uh, ideologues and propaganda. So gone are the days that an individual has to travel and physically meet with like-minded individuals uh, to learn about the ideology that may motivate them to violence. That's all, uh, they can find it just as easily in their basement on the computer. We are seeing the internet and social media enable individuals to engage and encourage other like-minded individuals without face-to-face -face meetings. As FBI Director Christopher Wray often says, terrorism moves at the speed of social media. In fact, we find that to be true every day in our investigations. An individual sitting in front of a computer in one country can communicate with, encourage, and inspire multiple extremist actors thousands of miles away in an instant. Social media provides an avenue for the rapid movement of information in a realm where radicalization is often a personal and anonymous process. As you can imagine, uh, law enforcement, the intelligence community, and academics aim to better understand this threat by determining commonalities or a profile of offenders. Earlier this month, our behavioral analysis unit at the FBI published a comprehensive report on lone offender terrorism, analyzing 52 attacks over a 43-year span. This report and several additional academic and government studies have supported the FBI's longstanding assessment that there is really no useful de uh, demographic profile we can point to. While attackers are mostly male and mostly born in the U.S., the similarities largely stop there. We've seen attackers span all ends of the economic and political spectrum with varying occupation, varying levels of education, marital statuses, and religions. One interesting demographic trend we can point to over the past couple of years is a decrease in the average age of attackers. In 2018, juveniles comprised nearly one-third of all identified homeland attackers or plotters inspired by foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. This underscores the susceptibility of some adolescents to ideologies that appeal to their desire for a sense of belonging or identity. Studies have also revealed that most successful attackers typically mobilize to violence nowadays in less than six months. This, com this commonality emphasizes the unpredictability of our subjects and demonstrates what we call the flash to bang mobilization lifespan or sometimes called case velocity, the, the time from which someone comes on our radar as possibly <laughs> plotting an attack to the time we actually have to consider some sort of disruption activity prior to when an attack occurs. That amount of time has been shrinking steadily. In some cases, it's not just, it's not months, it's actually weeks. With this mobilization period getting shorter, in some recent cases from months to weeks, we may not have long to act to prevent an attack. More often than not, we charge subjects with non-terrorism violations to disrupt them before violence occurs. For instance, in August, a Joint Terrorism Task Force arrested a man on federal firearms charges. This subject allegedly discussed attacking a Las Vegas synagogue in further of a racially motivated violent extremist ideology. While government and law enforcement still make attractive targets for violent extremists, recent attackers have tended to use easy to acquire weapons like firearms against soft or civilian targets hampering detection efforts. These targets favored by attackers since 2017 have included a bus terminal, New York City pedestrians, a festival, and a retail center, among others. 
In one instance, a juvenile inspired by ISIS attempted to detonate a homemade bomb in his high school cafeteria. Selecting familiar targets also reduces the need for pre-attack reconnaissance, again limiting opportunities for detection by law enforcement or bystanders. In recent years, we have also seen individuals, particularly juveniles, mix multiple extremist ideologies to develop unique personalized justifications for violence. Often and interestingly, when subjects mix ideologies, some of the elements of the ide ideologies are logically opposed to each other. You might consider this sort of a, a salad bar ideology. Uh, we see subjects seemingly selecting individual aspects of various beliefs that create some sort of common ground in their mind uh, supporting their interest in violence. For instance, just last, the, just last year, a U.S.-based subject discussed ISIS and violent jihad with a, group of, uh, with a group which follows a mixture of neo-Nazism, Satanism, and neo-Paganism. In short, ideologically fluid extremists may be drawn more to violence than the ideology itself. Uh, we're interested now in determining whether or not this may represent a shift from the notion of ideology motivating someone to violence versus the ideology being selected to justify actions by someone already interested in committing violence. I'll turn now to an issue that continues to limit law enforcement's ability to disrupt those increasingly insular actors I described. We're all familiar with the inability of law enforcement agencies to access data in some cases, even with a lawful warrant or court order due to encryption. In recent years, the FBI observed a decline in its ability to access the content of both domestic and international terrorists' communications due to the widespread adoption of encryption for internet traffic and the prevalence of mobile messaging apps that use end-to-end -end encryption as a default. In many places, quite frankly, we, we have effectively gone dark to those bad guy communications. As a private citizen and parent, I certainly appreciate that, incre that encryption increases the overall safety and security of the internet for us users. Uh, and even the FBI appreciates being able to communicate with our employees and sources around the world without exposing those communications to criminals, terrorists, or adversarial nation states. But in fulfilling our duty to the American people to prevent acts of terrorism, encryption creates serious challenges. Accessing content of communications by or data held by known or suspected terrorists pursuant to judi judicially authorized warranted legal process is getting more and more difficult. For instance, after more than two years, using the most advanced tools available, encryption still prevents the FBI from unlocking and analyzing the phone of a man who killed 26 people in Sutherland Spring, Texas in 2017. Additionally, if law enforcement loses the ability to detect dangerous criminal activity because communications between subjects, what we call data in motion, is encrypted in such a way that content is no longer accessible even with a lawful order, our ability to protect the American people will be degraded in a notable way. I believe there are solutions providers can deploy which would offer safety and security to those using the internet while also contributing to the FBI's ability to provide safety and security to the American people from terrorist, terrorism and other criminal acts like child exploitation and cybercrime. I'll switch gears again uh, to an important note about mitigation. The online encrypted nature of radicalization along with the insular nature, nature of most of today's attack plotters, leaves investigators with fewer dots to connect. With this very insular threat, we increasingly rely on the bystanders in these actors' networks, family members, peers, community leaders, and others, to notice changes in behavior and report concerns before the violence occurs. Between 2015 and 2018, only a quarter of our investigations that led to disrupted attack plots were initiated based on community bystander reporting. Unfortunately, of those individuals who did conduct attacks between 2015 and 2018, we found out after the fact that bystanders observed indicators of radicalization or mobilization for 90% of those attackers. 
One of the intelligence community's flagship initiatives for increasing bystander reporting is the Homegrown Violent Extremist Mobilization Indicators Booklet. I brought copies for those in attendance today, uh, and this content can also be accessed online at FBI.gov. This unclassified booklet that was produced jointly by the FBI, NCTC, and DHS describes observable indicators flagging the possibility that someone may be preparing to engage in violent extremist activity. The list of indicators covers activity that could be observable online, may be observable by family or friends, by religious leaders, and by private sector companies such as those in the financial or shipping industry. You may think of this as the see something, say something uh, messaging campaign for the modern threat. This summer, a man living in Pittsburgh was arrested by an FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force on charges related to his alleged plot to bomb a church in the name of ISIS. Among other things, the subject allegedly distributed propaganda materials and recorded a video of himself pledging allegiance to the leader of ISIS. These were observable mobilization indicators of imminent or near-term concern. While family members and close friends likely are best positioned to observe concerning behavior, Previous research determined family members and peers are often resistant to sharing their concerns with authorities. And of course, this further complicates detection efforts. Our JTTFs are hard at work engaging with the public and our private sector partners to message and equip them with resources for reporting concerning behavior to law enforcement. So with this shift in the terrorism threat, we recognize that tips from the public will be one of the most powerful tools we have in detecting and preventing attacks. Despite the successes that result from the hard work of the women and men of the FBI, our joint terrorism task forces, and from our partners across government, terrorism continues to pose a persistent threat to the homeland and to our interests overseas. And that's why the FBI consider, considers it its number one priority across the board. As we saw just recently with the arrest of a man in Pueblo, Colorado, who allegedly planned to bomb a synagogue in furtherance of his ideology, lone actors pose a persistent lethal terrorist threat to the American people. But this case also highlights the power of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, whose reach extends from coast to coast and around the globe, including in places like Pueblo. It is a force multiplier in the fight against terrorism. Together with our partners, we stand shoulder to shoulder and remain vigilant against these attacks. It's been said it takes a network to fight a network. While the whole of government approach has been successful in mitigating some of the threats posed by overseas terrorism networks, a whole of society approach will be required to mitigate the evolving lone offender threat within our borders. The FBI and our partners will continue to confront the threat posed by terrorists with determination and dedication to our mission to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. Thanks very much for taking the time to listen to me today, and I'm, I'll be happy in a moment to answer questions from the audience here.